A high-ranking American cardinal is being evicted from his Rome apartment by Pope Francis. But for what reason? The National Catholic Register senior correspondent Ed Penton has a report. And the reaction by some Catholic media to the news has been practically giddy. Associate editor of the UK Spectator, Damien Thompson, joins us with his perspective. And in an exclusive interview, Pope Benedict XVI's former personal secretary, Archbishop Georg Gonswein, talks about his new book, Who Believes Is Not Alone, My Life Beside Benedict XVI. It's a must-see interview. The world over begins right now. Now, Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me an X post. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. Lots to cover. Let's get to the big news breaking from Rome this week. An announcement in a report by the Associated Press that Pope Francis has stripped Cardinal Raymond Burke, the former head of the Vatican's high court, of his Vatican apartment and his pension. This follows the removal of Texas Bishop Joseph Strickland, as well as the dismissal of Pope Benedict's former secretary, Archbishop Georg Gonswein, earlier this year. Is there a pattern to these actions by Pope Francis? Here to report is senior correspondent for the National Catholic Register, Edward Penton. He joins us now from Europe. Ed, uh, the AP broke this news on Tuesday, which I found odd. Didn't come from the Vatican. It came via the AP. Uh, that Pope Francis would be taking back Cardinal Raymond Burke's Vatican residence as well as his salary. And according to reports that first surfaced uh, in Italian Catholic news blogs, Francis announced his plans privately at a meeting on November 20th. Now, anonymous sources quoted Pope Francis as saying, Cardinal Burke is my enemy, so I take away his apartment and his salary, end quote. What are you hearing from your sources about this alleged quote? And was this a surprise to people in Rome? Yes. I mean, first of all, Raymond, it, the Pope made it clear uh, later on that he didn't call uh, Cardinal Burke his enemy, but uh, the rest of it does mm -hmm. seem to be true. Um, he's, there's a bit of mixture, I think, of great sadness about this, of shock and, and really anger. Uh, and it's directed not really against Cardinal Burke, of course, but uh, against the Pope and the way he's acted about this, the way he's handled it, and and, and this decision of his to take away uh, Cardinal Burke's apartment and salary. And the the reason that's been given, of course, is that um, uh, the Pope sees Cardinal Burke as sowing disunity. But the disunity is really, I mean, you hear this a lot. It doesn't come from people like Cardinal Burke, who's merely trying to mm. uphold and be, remain faithful to divine revelation, apostolic tradition, holy scripture, and the magisterium. And um, the Pope, um, Cardinal Burke, in fact, said this only last month. He said, the sheep depend on the courage of pastors who must protect them from the poison of confusion, error, and division. And that's what he sees his role as. So that's how he sees, mm. he sees things. Um, but the disunity, really, I think many people see now, is the consequence of the Pope not really heeding the advice from cardinals such as Cardinal Burke and others who've made representations behind the scenes in private to him to change direction, and he's not heeded those those calls. It's a consequence also mm -hmm. of the persistent, I think, lies, deceit, and sophistry, which we've seen coming from not only uh, the people around the Pope, but the Pope himself. And that's led, I think, to what many people see as a decade of squabbling, acrimony, and division. It's also a consequence, as we know, of, of marginalizing and ignoring or insulting laity and clergy who dare to uphold the church's teaching and tradition and dare to preserve the deposit of faith, which, of course, is something which everyone says the Pope should be doing. So, so as you can see, the, the, the seeds of disunity, I think many people feel, do not come from somebody like Cardinal Burke, but from the Pope himself. Ed, Vatican spokesman Matteo Bruni um, ha has not answered any questions regarding Cardinal Burke's status. Instead, he keeps referring questions to the Cardinal or his office. Has the Vatican as yet responded or given any official reason as to why this action was taken? Burke told the Wall Street Journal he wouldn't leave Rome, even if he had to find other living arrangements because he considers it his duty as a cardinal to remain there. 
Right. Now, we've heard nothing at all from the Vatican about this, uh, nothing official. Uh, we've heard this through uh, Austin Ivory, the, the explanation given, who's his biographer. Uh, and Austin Ivory isn't uh, anything official uh, in the Vatican at all. So that's an, another surprise. And of course, a lot of people have also spoken about the the, the just the, how badly this has been handled by the Pope and the fact that he's He's let this be known first of all in private to uh, to uh, to the heads of dicasteries, uh, something very personal to Cardinal Burke, and then doesn't even con uh, notify the cardinal about about it when it makes it to the press, and instead goes through not even official channels but uh, his biographer, um, and and still hasn't notified the Pope at all about uh, officially about his plans. So the whole way it's been handled, I think, has been uh, many people see it as very regrettable. Yeah, well, it, yeah, I mean, we have to say it. I, I'm just going to be blunt. I've been blunt for years and years with this audience. I'm not going to stop now. This was a public hit, not a personal or private correction. It, th this could have been handled in private. Instead, it becomes a public spectacle because of the mm -hmm. way it was handled, leaked to the press, leaked to, to uh, Vatican officials. And next thing we know, we've got Austin Ivory, synodal expert and scribbler, being the mouthpiece, I guess, of the Vatican on this. Uh, uh, none of it makes sense. But look at in the wake of Pope Benedict XVI's abdication, Pope Francis removed Burke as head of the Apostolic Signatura, the Vatican's high court. He placed him as patron of the sovereign military order of Malta. Then he turned 75, the customary age of replacement, retirement rather, uh, this past June. And the pope removed him as head of Malta that same month when Cardinal Burke was still 74. His replacement was a Jesuit who's 80. Is this punitive action against those who question the direction of teaching under this pontificate? Uh, does this seem a vendetta to those in Rome? How are cardinals reacting? Well, absolutely. No, it does. And uh, and as, as much as his uh, the people around him who say, oh, it's, he's never vindictive like this. Well, that's clearly what's happening. He is being vindictive uh, because you just have to look at the at what's happened. Uh, and it always seems to be the case that those who who are faithful to the church's teaching, the prelates who who dare to uphold the church's teaching and, and are brave in doing so, uh, are getting are getting effectively persecuted and marginalized. Uh, and you're not seeing that with others, for example, the German bishops or those uh, prelates who clearly are pu pushing heterodox positions. In fact, they're they seem to be quite uh, quite strongly favoured. So, or if not favoured, they're they're mm. given uh, much softer treatment. So, so you're seeing a very much a, a, a strong contrast here in, in treatment between these two 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 sides in the church, if you like. Ed, um, you have written extensively about uh, the next pontificate, the men who who wait in the wings. Uh, you've got a whole book uh, to this effect. What impact might this be having? on the next conclave. I mean, I spoke to some cardinals, and I have to tell you, these are not conservative cardinals or traditional cardinals by any sense. They were kind of appalled by this action. And again, the way it was handled, not whether the pope could do it or not, but the way it was handled. And they suddenly feel they're all insecure in their position. And this, frankly, isn't what they bargained for. How might this shape the next conclave or the thinking of the men going into it? Well, again, I mean, as I've said before, I think that this is a really a, a pontificate of clarification, and you're seeing a lot of things being revealed, including uh, the way this pope really is and the way he's governed for the past 10 years. Uh, this is all coming out now. And I think you're going to see in the next conclave a, a strong reaction against this sort of uh, successor. They will not want a pope like Francis, I think, going forward, at least those who are following this. Uh, I think there's going to be a strong reaction. The pendulum will swing back and you'll see, I think, probably someone uh, quite, quite different than France's being elected uh, successor of, of uh, Peter. Yeah. And before we run out of time, the Pope's health uh, was a major news item this week. Uh, it, it looks like he has the flu, according to the Vatican, at least. And it was severe enough that initially they said, oh, he's fine. You know, he has a little lung infection. Next thing you know, they canceled that planned trip to Dubai for the climate change conference, which the Pope was really looking forward to and the world was looking forward to seeing him there. What are you hearing? How serious is his health now? Yes, I mean, it's always difficult to get exactly how real his state of health is but i think it is does seem to be quite serious i think there's the fact that he has breathing problems is is a concern because he as we know he only has uh, one and a half lungs he lost half his lung mm -hmm. or 
Manhattan when he was a, a young a young boy. So uh, this is considerable problem for him. Uh, he says he has a, a sort of infectious bronchitis, uh, and if that continues, then that is a concern. But he did seem considerably better today, uh, and so we'll see uh, how he's doing. But uh, but he does seem to be uh, quite. He has been quite quite poorly for the past few days. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Edward, we will leave it there. You can follow Edward Penton's reports and columns at X. Uh, he's at Edward Penton and at NC Register. Thank you so much, Ed. Thank you, Ren. Here with reaction and analysis of the media spin on Cardinal Burke's eviction is associate editor of The Spectator UK and host of the Holy Smoke podcast, Damien Thompson. He joins us from London. Damien, First of all, your reaction to this rogue action by Pope Francis, really unprecedented to rescind Cardinal Raymond Burke's Vatican residence and his pension. What is the message being sent here? I think my reaction was the same as yours, Raymond. This is petty, vindictive, verging on the sadistic. And I emphasize embarrassing because I think even the Pope's closest allies wish that he hadn't done something so petty. He humiliated, not for the first time, a cardinal who actually is very well liked in Rome, even by people who don't share his theological perspective. A cardinal who, yes, is critical of this pontificate, is critical of actions by the Pope, but is scrupulous about never crossing certain lines, never flirting with said of acantism, and is personally uncomfortable if people attack the Pope personally in his presence, which mm -hmm. is not actually true of all cardinals. And you and I, yeah. I think, both know, having met him, he's a warm and holy man, and it is so sad yeah. to see this being done to him. But I think we have to look at the reasons why this happened and why Bishop Strickland has just been subjected to this Kafka-esque treatment. Connect the dots between Strickland and Archbishop Ganswein, who was told to leave Rome uh, and return to Germany without given, being given an assignment at all. We're going to be talking to him in a moment. Indeed. I think there have been so many injustices. We're talking about the case of Cardinal Burke, the case of Bishop Strickland, Archbishop Ganswein, and, of course, the very different case of Father Marco Rupnik, who utterly scandalously mm -hmm. is still a priest, who is accused, he's a close ally friend, of his patron, Pope Francis, is accused of grotesque sexual and sacrilegious acts against women religious, which mm. are too disgusting to be described on a program no, like this. Heinous. It would be too distressing mm -hmm. for your viewers. I doubt that many of them even know precisely what is alleged. There are no canonical mm -hmm. proceedings against him. Um, we're still waiting for them. And so far as I know, the Pope hasn't even met any of the women who claim they were so horrendously abused by Rupnik. So there is mm. a growing perception of injustice. And as a result, people, including leading cardinals, who were seen as very close allies of the Pope, are beginning to sort of walk away from the scene of the crime, as it were. They don't want to go into the next conclave too closely associated with Francis, particularly if, like Tucho Fernandez, for example, and you may think this is ridiculous, mm -hmm. but they have ambitions to be papabile. Uh, Damien, papal biographer uh, and uh, obviously uh, mouthpiece now for the Vatican, Austin Ivory, uh, seems almost giddy writing a piece in where's, wherepeteris.com. Ivory recounts a meeting he recently had with Pope Francis just this week where they discussed the removal of Cardinal Burke. I'm going to put it on the screen. He writes, in the course of our conversation, Francis told me he had decided to remove Cardinal Burke's cardinal privileges, his apartment and salary, because he had been using those privileges against the church. After I came out from Santa Marta, I found it on a traditional news site. The meaning of this is obvious to anyone covering the Vatican. The leaker is motivated by animus against the Pope. Their story reported that at a meeting on November 20th with the heads of dicasteries, the Pope had told them, Cardinal Burke is my enemy, so I'm taking away his apartment and stipend. I knew this quote was pure fiction. Pope Francis would never conduct a personal vendetta, end quote. Damien, so Ivory says he knew that uh, quote about Burke was pure fiction. Uh, then I I'd like your, your reaction, given what we know of recent history. He goes to great pains also to demand obedience of the pope. And he conflates 
questioning, legitimate questioning of departures from church practice with papal disobedience. I'll give you the floor. I don't think we should give Austin Ivory the honor of taking his words too seriously. He's an operator. I've been watching him operate for over 20 years. I've seen him behave in the same obsequious way to other figures in the church. It really would be dangerous for me to talk too much about him because we go back too far. And mm. my opinion of him is well known and his opinion of me is very well known. But let me just emphasize one point that was made to me by a very well-connected person in the Vatican diplomatic corps. These are the last days for the very hardline Team Francis people. Cardinals and various other bishops are peeling off from this pontificate because its blunders have been so egregious and the behavior of the Pope has on occasion been so cruel, they don't want to be associated with him, as I said before. It leaves a little hard core of supporters whom the next Pope, liberal, conservative, whatever, will want to have nothing to do with. And so mm. they're enjoying their last moment of power. And mm. let them gloat, because before too long, they won't have the opportunity to do so. Damien, uh, Cardinal Burke spoke to Francis Rocha of The Wall Street Journal this week. And um, the Cardinal told Rocha he's heard nothing of this matter from Rome. Quote, people can draw their own conclusions about why the Holy Father told this to Austin Ivory and not to the person concerned. Damien, your thoughts, your reaction. Why would, why would the Pope and the Vatican use Austin Ivory as the official mouthpiece and not call the man himself, who has served the Vatican, by the way, faithfully for a decade? Because this is the Pope's modus operandi. I mean, when Ivory says that the Pope would never talk about his enemies, I can see Jesuits all over Latin America, all over the world, Argentinians just laughing at the thought that Pope Francis, as he now is, doesn't use that sort of language when talking about people he dislikes. He's the air turns blue, according to people who work in the Curia, when Francis is angry. So please don't expect us to mm. take that seriously. But the, uh, to address yeah. your wider point, yeah. you talk about the Pope and the Vatican. There isn't really a Vatican under this dictatorship Various curial officers, various prefects and, and secretaries of dicasteries, as they're now called, their only interest is in keeping in, at the moment, with their boss, because they know he punishes people ruthlessly and without warning, and that doing things without warning, in a cruel way, I'm sorry to say, is actually one of his signatures. No, it's, it's heartbreaking to watch this. And, you know, there's writing today in the Italian media oh, about the, the, the withdrawing of a cardinal's pension. This is a pension that he earned. He's now a retired cardinal uh, living in Rome, and now you take away his pension. But on what grounds? Now, the, the, if you believe what Ivory said, the pope believes that somehow— Cardinal Raymond Burke is using this to create disunity, to oppose the church. It, it, it seems to me, and look, I, I, I see all the people in the church and hear from many of them. Cardinal Raymond Burke is probably the most careful, judicious, uh, charitable uh, man out there. And he has been so deliberate in the way he poses questions and I think is trying to warn the Pope that he may be about mm. to exceed what the church would allow, which is the job of a cardinal to advise the Pope. I'll give you the floor. Exactly. You're precisely right. And let's look at the context. I was in Rome at the end of October when there were two disasters for the Pope. The first disaster was that the synod on synodality basically collapsed. Why? Because people were ground down by the sheer boredom and the inanity of the meaningless talk about synodality, which, by the way, is the official joke word of 2023. Nobody will use it next year because they're so sick of it. You saw these cardinals wheeled out at press conference having to talk about synodality. You could see they were, mm -hmm. they were absolutely wilting with boredom as they did so. The whole thing was a fiasco. And it was particularly a fiasco because in the last week of the synod, we had the story break and be confirmed on the same day of the incardination, the disgraceful incardination, of the disgusting Marco Rudnick. 
uh, which forced the Pope to backtrack, though, as I say, he still hasn't initiated any canonical proceedings. That was a disaster. And you have this little Praetorian guard of propagandists masquerading as journalists. And they tried to suppress the story for over 24 hours. I was walking around Rome, constantly checking my phone, thinking they have to have put something on social media about this huge story that's broken and being confirmed. Not a word for over 24 hours. So you had two big humiliations. And I remember thinking at the time, the Pope's going to hit out at the traditionalists, American traditionalists mm. in particular. What form will it take? Now we know. Damien, we will leave it there. And you can find Damien Thompson's commentary at spectator.co.uk and follow his ex post at Holy Smoke. Thank you, Damien. And on a much happier note, my new CD, Christmas Merry and Bright, remains the number one jazz release on Amazon. I am so thankful and grateful to you all for embracing it, making it part of your Christmas uh, preparation. But more importantly, I see it as a sign of joy at a very dark and confusing time. You can get your copy at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Apple Music, Spotify, the EWTN catalog, wherever you get your music. And I hope you'll come join me on the concert tour. I wanted to bring this music and an experience to you all. I have special guest stars, some incredible stars I can't mention, but uh, you'll have to come and find out. On Sunday, December 3rd, I'll be in Dallas at the House of Blues with Jose Feliciano. Friday, December 8th, in Tampa at the Straz Center. Friday, December 15th, in Cleveland with the great Frankie Avalon. And then the grand finale, Thursday, December 21st, at the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville. I hope you will come out, see the surprise guests, enjoy the music, and really be a part of Christmas merriment, I think, as it's never been experienced before. Not with this big band, anyway. And I'll be there to sing along, too. Go to RaymondArroyoChristmas.com for links about the tickets and everything else. Bring your family and friends. Cannot wait to make Christmas merry and bright with you. And he served as personal secretary to Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger and then to Pope Benedict XVI until his death in 2022. The 66-year-old German archbishop is without an assignment after being told by Pope Francis to leave Rome and return home almost immediately after Benedict's death. He's the author of a new book, Who Believes Is Not Alone, My Life Beside Benedict XVI. I sat down with him recently in New York to discuss the book, Cardinal Ratzinger's repeated attempts at retirement, and that fateful decision by Pope Benedict in 2013 to step down from his role as Supreme Pontiff. Here's my exclusive interview with a man who served two popes and lived with one, Archbishop Georg Ganswein. Archbishop, thank you for coming. Thank you for sitting down with the interview. It's great to see you again. Tell me, uh, in your new book, Who Believes Is Not Alone, uh, you give such penetrating insight into really not only the last years of Pope Benedict, but really your entire life with him, which, which covers, what, more than 20 years. I want to go to something more contemporary, the Synod on Synodality, which we just saw the first phase of. Pope Benedict was around when this was announced. Did he have any insights or concerns about this particular form of the Synod of Bishops? Do you recall? There is a very simple answer. He didn't command that. He read it, but he didn't command it. And I have not asked him. I cannot say why, but I said to, me, to myself, if he is silent about that, he will not be asked. And there was no question, no answer. Finito. Hmm. And, and, and that's how he really, is that how he absorbed, if you will, um, Pope Francis's papacy? He just sort of observed it without getting directly involved or commenting. That's right, that's right. After his resignation, he said, I'm not more Pope, I'm the Papa Emerito. The Pope is Francis. He is the successor of Peter actually etc. And he had the responsibility to guide mm -hmm. the church and not me more. Mm -hmm. And all the time, all the ten years, this was his navigation. Mm -hmm. It was his 
clear game. And okay, I want to talk later about his prayer life, about the personal side of him we didn't see. But I, I want to take you back. You opened the book in February of 2003. Now you were working then with Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger at the Doctrine of Faith. That's where I first met you. What happens during that coffee break in February of 2003, and why? I came to the Doctrine of the Faith in 95, hmm. and Colonel Ratzinger was convinced when he will ask Pope John Paul II, I am here more than 20 years. I'm an old man, I'm tired, I will resign. He told, he's, has written, and he was, there was no answer, not yet, because he came 82, yes. and uh, there was normally a prefect is uh, nominated for five years, another five years, mm -hmm. another five years, another five years, 20 years. And he said, he was convinced John Paul II will, this time, he will, he will accept, accept. Okay, that... Because he had tried to resign multiple times. He told me that in 2003. Yes, yes, that's right, that's right. And so he... There are the letters from him to the Pope and from the Pope to him, the answers. And then he said, in 2002, I, the first time, I will write another one, another uh, time. And then he must say, Okay, I accept. And he was convinced that he will be at most three, four months a prefect. Mm. But his former secretary uh, became an uh, undersecretary uh, of another congregation. Joseph Clemens. Yes. And I need a private secretary. And we two, she said, me, the cardinal, and me, uh, his spoken in Italian, Don Giorgio, mm -hmm. we will be, I don't know the precise word in English, in Italian it's provisorio. Provisional. He is a provisional, and me. Uh -huh. Because and he then, thought he was going to retire. Yes, and then I retire and he will go back to the old rule. Mm -hmm. Three months, there are 20 years, because there was no answer from Pope John Paul II month by month, and in April 2005, Pope John Paul died. The conclave, and from the Cardinal Ratzinger, what went out? Benedict XVI. And you got drafted into yes, becoming that was the Pope's secretary. Yeah, that private was secretary. The, the, the difference was not more living in the, uh, in the Holy Office and working, but in the Apostolic Palace. That's all. And that was in February 2003. He was convinced the answer will come. But the answer. Well, you write in the book that this retirement, and I've seen this not only in my interview, throughout his life, retirement, this quest for retirement. He wanted to retire to Bavaria with his brother. They were going to live in a little chalet and write and play music together. He sort of had this vision in his head. But you say in the book, it was a constant theme that was always out of reach. Why do you think he wanted to retire so desperately? Well, I think, and I've seen he was 70, he has seven, had 78 years, 78. Yeah. So 77, and his birthday uh, is April nine, uh, 16. Yeah. And April 19, he was elected Pope, three days after his birthday. Yeah. Now, one thing for him was very, very important to write or to finish a book about Jesus Christ. Like a, a witness about his personal scientific uh, life, about a priest, about a bishop, and also a cardinal, with all the experiences, the personal experiences. And therefore, he Okay, that's my, my future, and I have time, and I will finish that book. And I remember very well then 
in April he was elected. And then above two or three months later, because in that time, that three months, he didn't speak about the book. No word. Because he was convinced it's over. He won't be able to do it. It's not, it's not more possible. Mm -hmm. Being a pope, I have to do others. And in, Ju in June, I asked me, can you make a copy of this article? Of course, well, why not? Mm -hmm. And then, well, for me, it was the first time that that desire to continue was reborn. Mm. And that became the Jesus of Nazareth. T tell me about the historic resignation. Okay, here we are, February 2013. It shocked the world. But you knew about this, Archbishop. You had indications of this much earlier. How did you come to know that Pope Benedict intended to resign? And in the book you indicate that you tried to talk him out of it. Yes, How? that's right. We have been, it was September 2012, normally the, the Pope or the Popes have been from the 1st of July or after John Paul II, he liked to go first in the mountain mm -hmm. and then till October, Castle Gandolfo. Normally August was a, a free month, only the General, the general audiences and the Angelus Domini. Right, on uh, Sundays. Okay, Sundays. Mm -hmm. I've seen, in, in, after it was in March and April, he went to Mexico and to Cuba. He went back, was very tired, very, very, very tired. And then he slept step by step till July and in these days, from July to August, he was like exhausted. Hmm. Because in these days, or in these days, he finished the third, the small mm -hmm. Jesus from Nazareth. And I thought he was all the strength, all what are in reserve, mm -hmm. put down yeah. and put in. He expanded himself yes, writing that yes. book. And then in September, he said to me, normally I was uh, with, by him uh, rather 11 o'clock with the correspondence, mm -hmm. and then in the afternoon another time, two times a, a day. And he said to me, this evening came earlier. Please come earlier. OK. He came. And normally he sit down. He was sitting on the chair on the uh, table, mm -hmm. and I was up uh, the lay. And that said, no, take also you a chair. The first time in uh, eight years. Mm -hmm. I won. Okay, and then I have to say you something. And, uh, I'm old, I'm, I have no more strength. I reflected, I have reflected, I have prayed, I have struggled with myself. And I have come to the conviction, not only that I have to resign from papacy. I love of Jesus and the church. And I said, Holy Father, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, it's impossible. Far away. You can delegate this, this, this. Oh, no, I've spoken like a, a fighter about five minutes. He was still mm. silent. And then he said to me, excuse me. I have not said something to discuss. It's not more necessary. I have told you my decision. Mm. Mm. Oh, it was, it was that, in that moment I was, I was, I do not know, but it, it, it was heavy. Yeah. 
And that was the first, and, and, and then he thought, you will be one of the three persons who knows that. And please, you have now be under the pontifical secret. Wow. That was the first time a, me, a month ago. But did he consider the consequences of that? The, or, or I've read some reports where he assumed his protege, Angelo Scolda, was going to succeed him, or someone like him. Was that the thinking? I, I, I fear that was the thinking. Someone will come and to convince it's not possible, like me. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't hear it. No. Mm. I cannot say why, but it's, he said, no, it's, 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 I cannot more. And I think, and that all the years uh, after, when he was a resigned Pope or Pope Emerito, he never had a doubt that was the right decision. Was it, you've seen all the reportage. It was Vatty leaks, it was. No, 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 yes. Yeah. You, you don't, that has no, 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 no. That is, he said sometimes to me, my, there is no, there is no, there is no reason in all the things that are, went wrong. Mm -hmm. Vatty leaks or homosexual uh, groups mm -hmm. or that, sometimes that was in, in uh, it wasn't real. Mm -hmm. And in another way, he said, I, can go now because there is no danger of the church. If there is a wolf mm -hmm. coming and the, the shepherd cannot go, but if there is no wolf, there is no danger, I can. Mm -hmm. And the Lord will preserve and the Lord, the Lord will guide his church with another successor of, people, mm -hmm. uh, of Peter. Did he regret it? Ma never. How do you see those 10 years? Right. And how, I mean, I know he was praying. I know he was writing. I know he was suffering. Tell me about that time. The, the first two months, there was he was exhausted. He was uh, very tired. He has spoken very, very uh, little. Hmm. And then? After they come back to Rome, after May, the second May, I remember very well, more and more the strength came back. Wow. And that was, uh, he is a very uh, systematic man. No? Yes. Holy Mass, bravery, then the, the breakfast, mm -hmm. uh, rest, then bravery, then correspondence, lecture, music, bravery, and then lunch. Mm -hmm. After lunch, a small, a small uh, walk. We had, had a very t uh, the gardens. Uh, gardens. No, after the after lunch, we have been on our terrace in uh, in the monastery uh -huh. and rest. And then in the afternoon, the first was uh, the bravery, and then we went out to pray the rosary. Back correspondence, and there are, in the first year, at the end of the morning and at, in the late uh, afternoon, uh, there have been guests. Many, many uh, oh, asked, yeah. oh. And then uh, dinner, small dinner, and then he retired. And that's many, many years. Of course, he, he he did not. He did not write. He answered m the correspondence. Uh -huh. But there were a few occasions mm -hmm. where he was asked to say something, right. to write something, and also to help something. Hmm. And normally he could not say no, hmm. and he would not say no. I, I want to talk about Samorum Pontificum, which is one of the hallmarks of Benedict's legacy, of course. His focus was always on the reform of the reform of the liturgy. That was always his, really his life's work. And whether it was the translations in the Novus Ordo around the world, or permitting greater freedom for the old Latin rite. And I'll read from Samorum Pontificum. He said, it was always clear 
uh, or you write this, it was always clear in Ratzinger's mind that there was only one right, subsisting in the coexistence yes. of an ordinary and extraordinary form. The one intention of his motto proprio was to repair the gaping wound that had formed over time, be it voluntary or involuntary. Now, w what were the Pope's thoughts after he saw that motto proprio play out? Was he pleased with the, the way it was received at the time? In that time, Pope Benedict has been very weak. Physically. Physically. And normally, he asked me to, to read something he would read. And he was there on the paper, on the table, and I'm here. And I have read from the Osservatorio Romano the text, because that was the, only, the only text was published in, the, in that time in the Osservatorio Romano. I read and read, there was the motu proprio and also the, the, the letter of Pope Francis. You're talking about Custodis? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. so, yeah, so yeah. the motu proprio, so I was talking about his motu proprio and how it was received, oh. how Benedict was received. Oh, no, but now you're talking about oh. when Pope Francis yes. basically clamped down yes, on, yes. The, on the uh, Latin rite okay. and demolished that motu proprio. Know, about the, his motu proprio, mm -hmm. Benedict, no? yeah was uh, allowed to as a liberal, liberal, liber... You're right, liber it was a liberalization given, yeah. of the old right. Because what, that two intentions, the first, that the liturgy is the way to connect with God. And it's impossible that the liturgy, that was the liturgy for 500 years, many saints and will be forbidden or it's not more allowed. And the first step in that direction is made John Paul II. Yeah. Yes. That's the first. With Ecclesia Day, with where Ecclesia they, Day. they allowed yeah. it in certain well, instances with a, the permission of the and In the year after, Cardinal, Bened Cardinal Ratzinger and also Paul Benedict have seen that's good, but it's too... There are many, not, I do not know of many, but there are bishops that were, did not agree. And that's not good. And therefore he give more and more and more liberty. Mm -hmm. And let the priests decide whether of they course, wanted to celebrate the old rite or and not. And the second was, liturgy is so important that it cannot be forbidden by means or by motives or by reasons. They're not clear. Mm. And therefore, he said, we will, oh, I will open, and that must be, must lead to the peace in the, in the church regarding liturgy, and also mm. including then uh, Pius XII. Right. Yeah. And it worked. It worked. It brought peace. Yes. It, there was no problem or schism yet. In his retirement, in the book you relate, you sit at the table, you pick up Elizabeth yes, Romano, yes, yeah. you read yes. Pope Francis's motto proprio, which basically overrules Benedict and shuts down the Latin rite. What was his reaction? What did he say to you? Pope Benedict had never commanded decisions or motto proprio uh, from Pope Francis. It was very intelligent. <laughs> I've written also, it was my impression, Pope Benedict hearing what I was reading, his heart was very, very triste. And then when I finished, I said, Holy Father, Can I ask you a question? Please. I do not understand that motu proprio, because the liberty you have gave with your motu proprio mm -hmm. years ago have brought peace 
in the liturgy and in the church. And I fear this motu proprio will cause many, many problems. The answer was, I hope God will help us. He, has, he didn't commentate the motu proprio because I've come out there. he wouldn't comment decisions. But, but he did comment when Pope Francis submitted an interview to him that he had given in Italian. Oh yeah, that's what he so, Tell us about that. I think it was 2014 and mm -hmm. Pope Francis have given him an interview, mm -hmm. ask him, ask, ask him to give some impressions or, or a comment. Right. And uh, I remember very well because Pope Francis have given that to me to bring to Benedict and Benedict the sure. same way, okay. And he, he did it. But it's the only, only, I think it was the only time Pope Francis has asked Pope Benedict to, to comment or to, to, to give a comment to mm -hmm. that he, he said. And he, he wrote about, he particularly commented on Pope Francis's mentions of homosexuality, abortion, the way it was formulated. He took issue with the formulation. Pope Francis asked him to comment. Mm -hmm. And following, being obedient. Yeah. He did so. He did though. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Tell me about your, your, I mean, I see it in your eyes now. It had to be intensely difficult for you because here you are serving not only as prefect of the papal household under Pope Francis, the successor of this man you've served all these years, but you're living and continue to serve as the secretary of Pope Benedict. You were caught between these two men every day of your life. That could not have been an easy place to be. You are right. Mm -hmm. it, won't, it wasn't easy, but I haven't ma never thought, or I have never thought that once this situation will come, the situation was there, there was no manual to, 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 to see what I have to do then, and what I have to do there. I had, I had to do, I, I will not say I was living in two worlds, mm. but there were very different worlds. Yeah, and very different men. And very, of, of course, and although a different way, a different manner to, to, to govern the, the church, mm -hmm. to lead the church. I have done it, I've done what I was convinced, you have to do that. I was loyal, I am loyal to the Pope, of, of, of course. No? And the same thing I have I've done regarding Pope Benedict as a Pope Emeritus. Mm -hmm. It was not easy. I had a good, I had and have a good uh, spiritual director. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, I think it would, it had, would be impossible to survive or to live in a good, also in a good um, situation uh, by heart, a good situation in my spiritual life. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Because also me, myself, I'm, I'm a human being. Give us a sense of the personalities and the way in which each of these men conducted their papacy. Contrast them, if you will. I, I, I know Pope Benedict was so regimented, you said earlier, systematic in his day. And I saw that every time I was with him. It was, oh, time to go have to do this, we have to pray. You know, he, he would cut things off because he was on a schedule. Contrast that with Pope Francis's leadership style and personal style. That's a question I will answer with a phrase from Pope Benedict. He said, the mean, the most important thing 
a poor pastor do is to witness the faith, to be a good pastor, to love Christ and his church. And every, every pope seeing that for very important points has to do that with his personality, mm -hmm. with his past, with his biography. biography. Mm -hmm. In 2003, Cardinal Ratzinger told me something about, I asked him, is there a de facto schism in the church? Now this is back in 2003. He said these words and to me, they're almost prophetic. I would say this is a permanent problem of pastoral to help that all people can really uh, share the faith of the church authentically. So I think the first point is a good catechesis uh, that uh, in the preparation to the faith, in the education to the faith. The other point is also the predication that in homilies we can really year for year learn what is the faith, not only some or always the, the, the same ideas. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very real danger that in the homilies uh, priests and also bishops could repeat essentially their preferred ideas and not mm -hmm. present the completeness of the faith. So given those words and what we're seeing now, your thoughts on what he said there, and do you think we're in the middle of a de facto schism? where there are people who claim to be Catholic, but really aren't, or don't wish to be, deep down. There's a Latin phrase, de internis non judicat pretor. It means what a, a man really thinks, feels, you cannot see from outside. That is all, all for all priests. And I, the priest is not to, preaching, to preach his own ideas, but the gospel. Catechesis, homilies, that are the two, and the, the admission, uh, administration of the sacrament, that's the three canals for be or to be a good shepherd. And a priest is not is he's not employed by a by a, by a party or he is the first witness also of the, that what he's preaching. Mm -hmm. If I do not believe in that what I preach, people people feel that. Yeah, I, I want to ask you just before we we conclude. There was a story that went out. I remember this so distinctively, um, as I was on CNN at the time, when Pope. Francis moved into the Santa Marta house, which is sort of the hotel, the newest establishment in Vatican City. Um, many were saying, look how humble Pope Francis is compared to that Pope Benedict who lived in the apostolic palace, the grandeur of the apostolic palace. Can you write that narrative, if you will? I hated watching them try to play one pope against the other, particularly because I'd been in that room Tell us how Pope Benedict lived and what living in the Apostolic Palace really looked like from someone who lived there. The Apostolic Palace is a renational building of the 15th century. Yeah. Living there in the third floor yeah. is it's not a, it's not a, a luxury. Yeah. It's not uh, there are it's it's true that there are great rooms. Yes. Beautiful hallways, the of most course. spectacular hallways, yes. but the rooms, no, no. <laughs> they're like this. No, it's, it's, <laughs> it's nothing, nothing Very special. Spirit. Yeah. But it seems that not living more in that palace or in that place, but in another place, building, built up in uh, 1996, Six. 97. Mm -hmm. Although with the, with the technical and the, all the, 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 the nice Amenities. things, of course, <laughs> you cannot compare it that. And that it's not. It's not. Who knows Pope Benedict or Paul the Sixth or John Paul the Second? There was nothing special in that palace. 
Nothing special? Not in their apartment. No. I mean, they were little no. single bed. I mean, the bed, John, I remember seeing John yes. Paul's little single bed. Yeah, the, the same for Benedict. Oh, he kept the same yeah, setup. Of course, of course. Yeah, it's yeah. A, I mean, it, this was not luxurious at all. No. And it's kind of drafty in the winter. Oh. I mean, he, I remember seeing him uh, with a, yes. he looked like an Indian chief with a, you know, yes. blanket over his shoulder. But the narrative was born and therefore it's once about two months after the election of Pope, or three months, there was an audience with a, a school from school from, from, from Napoli, from Naples, and uh, one girl has asked Pope, Pope Francis, why did you change your home? Why not the Apostolic Palace? Why Santa Marta? And then he said, my dear, there is more a uh, psychological reason. And the first time he said, it's not because it's very, it, it's luxury or it's for the rich and no. Mm -hmm. But it was too late to change the narrative. Mm. Mm. Interesting. But it's, for me, that's, the Pope, is a man. The Pope has a, his personality. Mm -hmm. And then the papacy. And the papacy has all his, the form, or his forms, developed about many centuries. Yeah. And became a Pope means also to get down under that papacy. There, are, there is no private life more. I think that for Benedict, the most well, the, the, what was very heavy was to, to have no more private life. Mm. And that's, that's a, pri a prize, that's a prize? Yes. Being a, one of the uh, yeah. prize, being a pope. Mm. What do you want people to take away from who believes is not alone? My only intention was to distract, if it's possible, the, the, the false narratives about Josef Ratzinger, Cardinal Ratzinger, and Pope Benedict. One. Second, to correct many, many, many images of a man who was more shy, more humble, than a prepotent or a uh, Political man, mm -hmm. but I was a very intelligent man. The intelligence and all of the faith, the deepness of his faith, mm -hmm. the clearness of his faith, and also the ch faith is really one of the most important things to have joy in the life, mm -hmm. to connect with God, and to open the life for the eternal life. What that was you, only. What did you learn from him in those last days, in that last period? I mean, when you're with someone, particularly someone with a deep faith life, when you see them at the end of their life, going through the struggles that we all will go through, yeah. what did you learn from him? What did you take from that? Moment? Two things. The first thing, he was what he teached, he lived. And he lived that also in the last month and weeks and days, getting more and more down, weak. weak. The second, there is no reason to not remain a faithful Catholic because it's the direct way to the heaven. What a great way to end the interview. Thank you. Very Thank you. Very who Believes is Not Alone, My Life Beside Benedict XVI by Archbishop Georg Ganswein is available now at bookstores everywhere and online, including the EWTN catalog. That is all the time we have for now, but be sure to catch us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo.